Hi, I'm Edie Hapner, and we're going to talk a little bit about technology in voice care. You know, you usually see yesterday, today, and tomorrow, but in voice, things are changing so rapidly, today already is yesterday. So we'll talk about today and tomorrow, what's in the future. The technological boom in voice care in about the 1990s changed everything. It changed the way we assess patients, the way physicians diagnose patients, and the way we develop our treatment. We're going to talk about the technological boom in several different areas. Advances in laryngeal imaging in the 1990s made the biggest change in the way we practice voice. Physicians are now able to look at the vocal folds and make diagnoses that they were never able to make prior to that time because of the magnification and the illumination and some of kind of the add-on technologies that I'm going to tell you about. And what that translates to is better diagnoses means better, more rapid treatment. And for us, better diagnoses by the physician and the ability to watch the functioning of the vocal folds has taken us from what's called symptomatic voice therapy of the 70s and 80s and a little bit even in the early 90s to what we call physiologic voice therapy. So I don't base my voice therapy on if their pitch is high, lower it. If their voice is too loud, make it softer. I base my therapy on the functioning of the vocal folds and the surrounding cooperative tissue and of the resonatory cavities and of the lungs. And I want to change physiology because I can see it so I can change it to make the ultimate outcome a better outcome for the patient. You know, back in 1854, Manuel Garcia was credited with developing the first usable method for looking at the vocal folds. Now, Manuel Garcia was a voice teacher. He wasn't a physician. He was a voice teacher, a vocal pedagogue, and a singer. And he discovered that if he wore a light on his a mirror, excuse me, on his head, and he shined a little light on that mirror, and the light reflected on a little mirror that he held in the mouth of some of his patients or the people that he taught voice lessons to, that he could actually see their vocal folds. Now, what's important to remember is that Manuel Garcia could see them this size and not very well, and only in a patient or student in this case who didn't gag a whole lot. Things have changed dramatically, and laryngoscopy of today looks a little bit like this. This is if I'm looking at the vocal folds with the naked eye. Oh. may seem a little jumpy, the reality is when you look at the vocal folds with the naked eye, you are only able to see a blur. It's the hummingbird philosophy. When the eyes look at the wings of a hummingbird, the wings flap so rapidly that our eyes can't keep up, our eyes and our brain, so all we see is the blur of the flapping. Well, our vocal folds vibrate so quickly 200 times around for women and around 100 times a second for men that the eyes can't keep up. So when we look at the vocal fold with just a scope in there with no advanced technology, all we see is a blur. That doesn't provide for optimal diagnoses if you can't get a good picture. So in the early 1990s, a technology called stroboscopy has come into being. And video stroboscopy actually is an optical illusion. And what it does is it peak picks from cycle to cycle, puts them all together to make you believe you're seeing a constant cycle of vocal fold vibration, and you can see the pliability of the tissue. The, the key here is that it's an optical illusion. 
So what you're seeing isn't one cycle. It might be 300 cycles in three, in three seconds of a man holding an awe, or 600 cycles in three seconds of me holding it. And a little peak is picked from each one of those put together. And I might see what looks like three cycles of vibration. You understand? That, so there's some concern that video stroboscopy isn't reality. I will tell you that video stroboscopy is what's changed our lives, especially as a speech pathologist, because I can look at the pliability of the vocal folds. I don't diagnose lesions. I assess function. And only video stroboscopy allows me to see this. Video stroboscopy is, in my life, something I do 10, 15 times a day, depending on what my clinical day is involved. But there was a recent study that came out in one of the otolaryngology journals where they polled all the ear, nose, and throat doctors in the country, in the United States, and said, when you diagnose a voice problem, do you use video stroboscopy? And only 6.2% of all the physicians in the United States use video stroboscopy. And I will, will tell you without question, video stroboscopy isn't just the gold standard in diagnosing voice disorders. It is the standard for diagnosing voice disorders. So let's talk a little bit about what the future holds. Now, on the left here, you're seeing what? real-time vocal fold vibration. This is high-speed laryngeal imaging, and that is one single cycle of vocal fold vibration. That is real-time, one single cycle of vocal fold vibration. So whether that's a man or a woman, I can't tell you, but you saw every vibratory cycle within a second of collecting sound. So. It takes away those concerns of the optical illusion and us missing something. High speed is available now, but high speed isn't being utilized now because, one, it's a bigger scope and harder for patients to tolerate. It gets hot pretty fast. <laughs> True. It's so labor intensive to actually analyze thousands and thousands of cycles of vibration that it hasn't really moved into the clinic yet. But I think very soon it will move into the clinic and we'll all be doing high speed. This is another technology called narrowband imaging that has made it to the operating room but hasn't made it to the clinic yet. And narrowband imaging, you see the little bits of green in there? That's not green dye like a fees exam. That's actually a color spectrum. So narrowband imaging by utilizing different color spectrums allows us to see the vascularity within the vocal fold tissue and within a lesion that far surpasses any other method of us looking at the vocal folds with the naked eye or with video stroboscopy. And so it's made it to the operating room because it helps with diagnosis and it certainly helps with excisions of different lesions. Another technology I think will make it to the clinic soon. So technologies change the way we conduct therapy. I told you this already. Anatomical and physiological assessments specifically provided to the speech pathologist through video stroboscopy, whether I'm doing it myself or whether a physician is sending me a patient and sends me a copy of their exam. By watching video stroboscopy and watching the function of the, the tissues, I'm, able, I'm better able to plan therapy. I can personalize my therapy. There's no cookbooks for me. I can make it outcomes-based and accountable because I can look at pre, I can look at middle, and I can look at post and see what's happening with those vocal folds and how the function is changing. And I can make my therapy patient-friendly. I'm going to talk to you a little bit next about some patient-friendly technology that we're utilizing now in the clinic. You know, I'm actually talking to you about all three. 
So not just patient friendly, but also personalized. Video stroboscopy allows personalization, but so does some new, very interesting dosimetry products that are out on the market. When I started in voice therapy, people would come in, we used to call them vocal abusers, we don't anymore because that's not a politically correct name and it might impact their adherence to therapy. So now we call them vocal overdoers and we say they have phonotrauma, not vocal abuse or vocal misuse. So when a patient came into my office who was an overdoer, I would want them to keep track of their day so I had a better idea of when were they overdoing. So we would give them a chart and they were supposed to put little tick marks in every time they yelled or cleared their throat or talked in a noisy environment. Well, you can probably understand there were some problems with this, not least of all the fact that, and I have said this before, Patients that end up in my office are generally not ones who have a lot of self-perception about their vocal behavior because they wouldn't keep doing it if they knew it was causing the problems that they ultimately end up having to come to therapy for. So they may not even notice it. It also causes patients to lie to me because in general, we like each other and they want to please me. So they fill it in while they're in the waiting room. So what we have now is vocal dosimetry. It is a computer-based method of tracking how many times your vocal folds vibrate in a given period of time and how far they move with each one of those vibrations. And that measurement can be in miles or kilometers. So what you see there is a computer-based product that Yes, they have to wear on a fanny pack, which not everybody loves, but they can wear for up to 13 hours at a time with a little accelerometer just glued here and hidden through their clothes so it's not super notice noticeable. And what we get is a printout of their vocal day. It's spectacular. I can look in three minute increments at what they're doing because you know, I've been floored time after time when I believed that a patient's job at the call center had to be causing her voice problems. And when we hooked her up to this and she came home, came back to therapy with this printout, what I found out, it was what she was doing after work, not what she was doing dur during work that was causing her continued voice problems. So this allows me to personalize, get good information, and be both accountable and look at outcomes. One of the other ways that we can be personalized, user-friendly, and look at outcomes is the wonderful boom in the availability of apps. No matter how old my patients are, they have iPhones, they have some kind of smartphone, an iPhone, an Android, an iPad. It's crazy. If they don't have it, they're willing to go out and get it. And what we've started using a lot in therapy is free, in voice therapy, is free downloadable apps to help patients engage more in therapy. Because Ava Van Leer and Nadine Connor taught us as recently as 2012, when patients use gadgets, they enjoy therapy more. And when they enjoy therapy more, they're more likely to practice. And remember, the only way voice therapy works is if you actually do it. One of the new devices that's coming out that I've been playing around with for some colleagues is called the iVoice. And that is a personalized smartphone-based product that allows people to practice in any scenario, to keep track of voice things, and to even easily send messages to their clinicians. Crazy. <laughs> Another way that has helped us, another technology that has helped us with both the accountability and the outcomes measuring is the wonderful acoustic and aerodynamic equipment that we have now that allows us in a non-invasive way to get baseline measures and then to repeat in very standardized processes. Mic to mouth distance is standardized. The, the room is soundproofed, and I know the, the sound level in the room that's reported. The instrumentation is calibrated. Gosh, we feel like audiologists now, don't we? 
and we're able to look at pre and post measures and feel good that we're getting accurate information and outcomes-based accountable therapy. And lastly, our therapy is now what I would call patient-friendly. And why do I say this? I say this because I believe that the wave of the future, that we are going to be mandated in some fashion to do telehealth. And we know from some great research by Tyndall and colleagues and Mashima and colleagues that we can give voice therapy in our office over a secure internet line with our patients that may be a hundred miles away in a part of the state where there aren't speech pathologists that can do voice therapy. There may not even be a speech pathologist or they may not be able to get in to, to see us and we can provide therapy that has comparable outcomes, whether we're sitting across the table from them or we're, whether we're doing it via telehealth. And I think that is very, very exciting. So what does the future hold? With the changes in healthcare and the changes that it's demanding, that the new healthcare system is demanding that we practice within, and the need to do shorter, more accountable, more personalized therapy, I think that our future is going to be based on figuring out fun ways to get our patients to engage, like gadgets and apps, patient-friendly scenarios like telehealth, and personalization, doing a good evaluation that lets us design a therapy that's for each one of us, each one of our patients individually, not something that is applied generically to every patient, but something that actually meets their needs and their preferences and their values. That's how we're going to provide good therapy. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Here we go. If technology is um so important for the future in voice therapy. How do you handle a client that is completely adverse to the thought of technology? And um, I handle them by making CDs and DVDs. <laughs> and believe it or not, I still have a tape recorder. It's just <laughs> harder to find cassette tapes for that person on occasion who has nothing. But you know what I've actually found? Very few people are adverse especially when you show them how simple it is. And I don't think there's anything wrong with taking some therapy time to teach somebody how to utilize an app or even downloading it for them. You know how many times I get handed a phone and I'll say, what's your, what's your app password? <laughs> what's your, here, type it in and then I'll do this. I don't think, I think that less and less people are becoming a, um, averse to that. Look, you know, even my patients that are in their 80s, if they don't know how to, to do something, oftentimes I'll ask them to bring their children or their grandchildren or sometimes their children's children's children, depending on how old they are, to come into therapy and to set up a system that works for them. I've been doing that for years. Anyone else? Can you talk a little bit about ways to get out and do, prevention is part of what we do as speech pathologists, so can you talk a little bit about the kinds of things that we can do to educate the aging population about, you know, aging related problems that happen with their voice or, you know, how to get them to be a little bit more perceptive of what's what kind of changes are occurring, and get them into the ENT a little bit earlier. What kinds of things have you found to be effective that we could do? You know, we have to educate everyone, not just older people, um, especially about um, getting to see an ear, nose, and throat doctor sooner and about, um, no, a, a hoarse voice isn't normal, even if you've had that voice since you were four, right? Um, because I have lots of stories that have had people pro had problems since 
birth that were not diagnosed till much later. But I think, I think you're right. I think it is incumbent on us to do a better job of educating the public. I still have people that come in all the time, and I've been standing in the same spot for 10 years, that say, I didn't know anybody did something like this. And we haven't moved. We've done tele, <laughs> we haven't moved. We've done tele television spots and newspaper articles. I just did an AJC article not that long ago. And I don't think there's an easy, simple answer. April 16th is World Voice Day. So I, it's a one-day opportunity to educate the world. I don't think that, it's a world initiative, by the way. I don't think that's enough. I don't think that's enough. In, for me, prevention is a huge part of my job, and I don't do it one day a year. I do it a lot. I think we just have to keep pushing, you know? I think we just, I mean, I post stuff on Facebook all the time. It's World Voice Day. And yeah, I'm not very good at Facebook, and my kids have to call me all the time and go, take that down. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know how to do that. But whatever method that, I, that we can do, I think is a great method to get the word out. If we tell one person, they might tell the next person, and that's what we can hope for. I think Ash is doing a great job with all the new social media sites and with a wonderful campaign called Know the Signs that we, I don't think we've seen yet here in the Southeast, but it's playing other places to educate parents about hearing loss in their children and pay, uh, parents about speech um, delays in their children. But let's think about this. There's about 18 different specialties in speech pathology now, so it's going to take a while to get around to all of us for ASHA to do something. So I think it's everyone's responsibility. Anyone else? <laughs> the vocal dosimeter, am I saying it correctly? Uh, yes, dosimeter, it's fine. Is it, um, is it on the market? Available yes. For Yes, so there's a couple, okay? What you are looking at in the pictures is called the Ambulatory Phonation Monitor, and it's made by Pentax. And it's, um, it's research-wise, it's the best tool to use because it was developed uh, to a level that we can feel comfortable doing research with it. It's a little bulky. Um, there's another one called the Vocal Log, that is also on the market that is, um, was developed by Griffin Labs. It's not really research ready, but you can certainly use it clinically. It's a small little device that you can put on the arm, you can put in your pocket, and it also works on kind of a small accelerometer. Looks a little bit like a microphone for people to wear. It's very um, patient friendly. It, you know, and that one, by the way, you can leave on for three full days. Well, you take it off to shower, but you don't have to recalibrate it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the wave of the future, too. Anyone else? Well, thank you all. Don't avoid technology. Enjoy it and embrace it. <laughs>